Um, I think it's a good one, but can you know, I started out with this <laughs> Some verses in the Bible are more popular than others. And Proverbs 23, verse 7, is one of those beautiful passages that has appealed to many people. In fact, the inspirational writer James Allen wrote several books on uh, one line and tried to develop it as an entire way of life. The most common translation of that one line is, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, it's yes. <laughs> as it's on. I think so. Yes, it is. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, in these talks on astrodiagnosis, we're trying to explore how thoughts become illnesses. Now, we could state that passage in another way, is what we think is what we become. Like all forms of mysticism, the Rosicrucian philosophy teaches that just about everything in our concrete existence begins with thought. As we develop in soul growth and consciously attune ourselves to Christ in the life spirit, we open ourselves to something a little different. We open ourselves to direct intuitive impulses from life spirit. These intuitive impulses bypass the mind and the desire body, and they strike directly on our etheric soul body. And that way we avoid that nexus of difficulty of the coalescence of the lower mind and the desire body that we call the pseudo-self. This is one of the great consequences of the sacrifice of Christ. Our introduction to sin occurred in what is called the fall. And sin introduced us to a way of life that is outside of the order of things. And so it had to be balanced with something else that was outside of the order of things. And that is what grace is in the form of intuition or direct truth or direct love that comes to us bypassing the normal way of things. Now the normal order of things, which is still prevalent and preponderate in our life, is that the self, the threefold spirit, was to enter into its vehicles, beginning with the mind, and um, become a creator by creatively spiritualizing all of its beings. We become uh, divine throughout our existence or throughout our whole being, and. Beginning with the mind, our first creative work is thinking. In fact, the primary service to our solar cosmos from humans is creation of thought. The service of the minerals is to provide form, stable form. The service of the plant kingdom is to provide vitality. Neither animals nor humans can live without the vitality that is specialized from the light of the sun by plants. The service of the animals is to provide in their species objectifications of different kinds of desire. 
This is why the zodiac is called the circle of animals, because they represent all of the different animal species that are part of archetypal ideas that uh, are focused to us through the zodiac. And it is humans, our service is thought. Because of all of the kingdoms that are manifest in this outer chemical physical world, we are the only beings that can think and that can bring meaning and reason and purpose into this world. So that is our primary uh, service to the world. As we observe life and as we observe the world around us, we see the effects of thought. And it becomes obvious that not all thoughts are equal. Some thoughts are shallow, and their effects vanish very quickly. We call them fads. Other thoughts are deep, and their effects sometimes last for centuries. Now, the findings of the seers, their observations and their corroborations that became the Rosicrucian philosophy, agree with this. They agree about the observation of comparative depth of thought, and they carry it further. The Rosicrucian philosophy teaches that some thoughts never leave the world of thought. We'll chalk it up the jet lag. <laughs> We're talking about the manifestations, creative manifestations from thought. So some thoughts never leave the world of thought. Sometimes it's because they are only about thought and they do not have to manifest any deeper. And some thoughts never leave the world of thought because they are weak. They have no oomph behind them and they can't get out of the world of thought. So the, some people or some thoughts manifest into the desire world. And they go no farther than the desire world. And the same conditions are there. Some thoughts never leave the desire world because that's all they're about. They're only about desire. And again, some never leave the desire world because there is no creative will to carry them any further. Now, people who never bring their thoughts through the desire world into motiv from, uh, into motiv by motivation, we call those people dreamers because they only dream and they don't do. Most of the time, thoughts carry through the desire world where they pick up motivation and they carry into the etheric realm. And again, some get no further than uh, the etheric realm. There's action, but it's sort of a quiet action. It's like the people who say, I like work, I can sit and watch it all day long. Yeah. <laughs> they, don't, uh, they don't do anything with it. And some things are meant to stay in the vital world. A good example of that is suggestion especially auto-suggestion. Thoughts need only go as far as the vital body to accomplish what they need to accomplish. Now, all of these things are well, and all of them are good. But usually, our object is the chemical subdivision of the physical world. We want our thoughts to become things. We want them to have material reality. 
we want to change the world around us because we're creative beings. That's part of our work. The mineral kingdom is our primary service. It is where our thoughts are the most used at this time in evolution. Now, this is all pretty interesting, but the Rosicrucian teaching has very fabulous ideas about creative thoughts. In fact, the Rosicrucian philosophy teaches us that eventually our thoughts will become so penetrating and they will come from a deeper source within ourselves that we will actually draw out the potential of life that is now in the mineral kingdom. In short, we will learn to think life. Not just manipulation of DNA, which is just another manipulation of form. It allows some things to come in and not others. That's not thinking life. But eventually, our thoughts, we will, in our thoughts, we will think life. And things will live as long as we can hold them in our consciousness. As we mentioned a couple nights ago, a bacterium might have a very short lifespan because the angel that is holding that bacterium into existence only has that long of a uh, attention span. The Rosicrucian philosophy is even more fabulous than that in that it says eventually our thoughts will carry into the life that will have become plants and it will bring out the ability to make dynamic change, to make dynamic change by motivation, and to be motile instead of just planted like a plant. In short, we will eventually take the becoming beings that are now in minerals and bring them to an animal-like condition. And by the end of this evolutionary creation, we will be able to bring those becoming beings to be beings. We will help them to produce minds. And when they have minds, their own spirit can enter in and they can begin in the creative activity. Well, this is all pretty fabulous. And it gives us something to hope for. Uh, it's it's important. Now, actually, you might it must might be surprising to you, but in this room, this is a laboratory for thinking life. Every week we have a we do the Rosicrucian healing service, and in that healing service we pray with such depth that we try to reach life spirit and bring it through what is called the oceanic region of our concrete minds to produce a living, vital substance for healing. So it's a long way in the future, all of these things that we're talking about, but we're working toward that now. See, the Rosicrucian philosophy is very optimistic and really gives us something to shoot for. You know, it's almost impossible to think life right now, but nobody ever said that uh, mysticism or trying to attain to the character of Christ is easy. What are we going to do? We're going to sit around and watch television? We might just as well uh, be a, get to work. All right, so far we have established that there are different strengths of thought and different intensities of thought and that there are differences in the depth of thought. These differences in depth occur in various ways. Some are deeper or shallower in understanding, and others are how deep they penetrate into materiality, and is another is how deep they come from in our concrete mind, which is what we've just been talking about. Now let's look at another quality of thinking. Let's look at coalescence. Being focused almost exclusively 
and continuously when we are awake in the chemical subdivision of the physical world, and especially the uh, solid state that we are in, has produced a preoccupation of us, of our consciousness, that has produced some illusionary attitudes. We think that everything is as concrete and as discrete as things are in solid. We think that we do not flow into each other. It's like this chair is different from that chair. It's a, we, we, that's, that's an illusionary way of thinking. We think that way despite the fact that even the liquids and the gases flow into each other. And there are discrete states even of the gases when a cold front moves in, you can feel within minutes that uh, some, you have crossed the border. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that the deeper we go into the spiritual worlds, the more subtle things are, and the more elusive things are. Max Heindel gives us a, a picture of that when he said, when you look at the desire body aura, it changes colors extremely fast. Our emotions change extremely fast. So, the reality is that things are more subtle and things are more fluent. But at the same time, there is a greater constancy of things in the spiritual worlds. Some people focus on that constancy by saying God is unchanging. But at the same time, every time they experience something in spirit, it's all new. It's all different. It's never been like that before. Now, these qualities of harmony and unity and fluidity work together. And they come together. Things in the inner world seem to come together and coalesce. One example of this is the law of attraction in the desire world. Like attracts like. Another example is an attitude by which thoughts of a given kind that are similar, thoughts and emotions of a given type come together and they coalesce. And when they coalesce, there is a general field of attitude. And that field of attitude takes on a kind of form. And if we persist in an attitude and it becomes more and more specific and built stronger and stronger, it becomes an entity. Yesterday we looked at the horoscope of a cancer patient who had a tumor, and that tumor had a entity within it, and that entity was a guilt embodiment. Now, each of our bodies, our mind, our desire body, our vital nature, and our dense physical body, began as a thought. What the dense physical body is now, that form or that thought that began as the dense physical body, what it is now is very different than it was a few million years ago. Or it's extremely different from what our dense physical bodies were in the moon period. So the, there is a constancy a coalescence of thought, 
for the positive, not just an entity, but for the positive that is the physical body, is pretty constant. Christ in the Bible says, who among you can change his body one cubit by taking thought? Now, a lot of this constancy is due to a residual accumulation of experience over many rebirths, over many centuries, we have learned to adapt to the environment and we have consolidated uh, thoughts so that our bodies have, it's very hard to change them because they, they have this accumulation of all this experience that is really very real. And um, this is so such that the consciousness of other beings, such as divine spiritual hierarchies, they have their own constancy, and their constancy is so great that we consider what they are or what they manifest as laws of nature without realizing that they are beings, what we call laws of nature. Now, Within all of this fluidity, there is a quality that is very hard to speak of or to uh, expostulate, and that is a quality of withinness, which is a kind of interdimensional uh, fluidity. And when it comes to the thought form that becomes the physical body, the archetype, there are archetypes of cells which are within archetypes of tissue. So thought forms are within the other thought forms. And organs have both archetypes of tissues and, or, and of cells within them. But they are even more uh, interdimensional than that. But putting them all together, there is a common thought an archetypal thought that holds all of these things together. The important thing about all of this is that inner is this inner fluidity means that change is possible. And it means that change can be done on the fly. It may be hard to change our body by one cubit, but persistently changing our attitude, persistently changing our thought, we can actually change even our physical structure. It's easy to change the mind, but you have to be persistent and very deep to carry it all the way into the physical body. This is what it is meant by healing. Healing is a change of course. It is a change of attitude. It's not the same thing as snapping a wire and then all the appliances shut down. We're talking about an ongoing system, and in this ongoing system, we can institute changes within. Life is not stopped. It goes on. The whole evolutionary creation is a steady stream. And within that steady stream, there are all sorts of things uh, going on. Now, if we put all of this together that we've been talking about, we can see that bad thoughts coalesce and form a bad attitude. And if there is persistence, that bad, those bad thoughts take on bad emotions. And then we have not only a bad mental attitude, we have a bad emotional attitude. And if we persist in bad thoughts and emotions, they become a bad way of life. And if they're negative, they can even shut down vitality in us. Now, the amount of time that this takes varies from individual to individual, and uh, the circumstances involved in the evolution, creative evolution of the thought.
We're saying that even our illnesses are creations. They're creations of our minds. They happen to be deviant creations, but they are uh, creations of our mind. Eventually, these things crystallize into our physical bodies, into the chemical subdivision of the physical plane. And then things can go no further. This world has limitation upon limitation, and that is its purpose. In these limitations, our creations become objectified. And until they are so simple and so clear that we can't doubt them. So, we may try to change our thinking or we may try to deny our thinking, but we can't do that. If a bone is broken, the bone is broken. It's, it's in one way or the other. And we can try to do what a lot of people try to do. Doctors can tell you right away that some people lie to themselves, saying, I'm not really negative, or I'm not really ill. And they're not doing positive thinking, they're denying. You can't do that when you're ill, when you suffer. When you're suffering, there is no doubt but that you're suffering. Now, that knowing of suffering is much deeper than we think, or than most people think anyway. The suffering is real. And there is no denying that it is real. And it sinks in. And it sinks into our being more and more deeply. And the spirit, much of which is not awake, the greater part of our spiritual being we are unconscious of. The spirit knows what it what the suffering is, and it knows uh, that uh, the attitudes surrounding the suffering are part of the symptoms, and they are the causal part of the causal change that produce, chain that produced the condition. So the conscious personality may not know what's going on. Though some people lie in a hospital bed and say, why is this happening to me? And if they listen, they might get an answer. But they have no idea that the spirit is watching. Now, in this, the most humiliating thing about being ill is the realization that it had to come to this before we knew that we were doing something wrong. It had to be carried so far that it became an illness that we couldn't deny that we had been doing something wrong. This is why things like retrospection are so important. Because Something does not have to follow the causal chain all the way from the spirit doing misthinking and becoming a physical illness. If we're retrospecting, right, we can see what our attitudes are. And we can intuitively see that some of those attitudes are not good. And when we see that, we can change it. And we can understand the effects of our thoughts and desires before they become manifest as physical conditions. Retrospection is the best preventative medicine that we probably have. It prevents us from be, being from suffering. This is why the um, healing service that we use in the Rosicrucian Fellowship is um, there to produce change. It's there to relieve unnecessary suffering. There's some suffering that you have to go through by experience to learn, but we're, because we're, since the fall, we've lost touch with the Spirit. And when we lose touch with the Spirit, we 
make the same dumb mistakes over and over again. So it would be enough if we just made one mistake and suffered and, and changed, but we hang on and do it over and over again. Now, if we can be brought to the awareness that change can be brought without harm to the body, to the temple, it's so much the better. And this is, again, why retrospection is such an important thing. This is why we study astrodiagnosis. We're finally getting to it. <laughs> there are five pages of notes, four of which are on spiritual philosophy and very little astrology. All right, for the past few minutes, we've been speaking of illness as a destiny. Almost like a flushing of the toilet. We're flushing out bad thoughts and emotions and when we have suffered them and the spirit understands uh, we're done with them, we say to ourselves, either consciously or unconsciously, never again. And that sticks. That's, how, that's, that's what an old soul is. An old soul is somebody that has experienced a lot and has changed from that. Now, if you'll notice, in the last few minutes is the first time in these three talks that we've talked about bad thoughts and bad desires. And those are words of judgment. And when judgment enters into a discussion, all sorts of problems come up. Everyone seems to believe that their own judgment is right and uh, the others are not. And anyone who disagrees must be wrong. And if it's carried even further, anyone who disagrees must be bad. Often some people are not shy about judging the value judgments of others. Now it's likely that this behavior on all sides, the judges and the judges of the judges, is symptomatic. If that weren't so, we would have an abundance of saints. And we don't have many saints at all. So we're all in this, and we all uh, pass negative judgments. And sometimes, if we are in a spiritual movement, our judgments are exceedingly strong. Another one that's too far to go into. Um, I don't doubt that there is a moral objectivity. And I don't doubt that we have intuitive moral insights that are true. But that's not where the problem comes. The problem comes in the interpretation. Now we see through a glass darkly. And therefore, we skew things. So there probably is a valid, objective system of ethics. But it is not codified. It's not codified by Max Heindel. It's not codified by anyone else. Someone like Max Heindel can see deeper into spiritual reality and can see the cosmos uh, more clearly and correctly and such a person has the right to speak even the duty to speak about what is seen however unless this is a means to reharmonize us it doesn't help us it gets put into that same soup of judgment the objective values in the cosmos are not in a system. And it's up to us to find them, and we find them by living them. And we can tell whether we're living right according to, objectively according to the cosmos. That's one of the things we try to do in retrospection. The best way to find the divine morality or the divine ethics is in experience. 
Now, purgatory and first heaven are perfect examples of objective ethics. They aren't based on any uh, theology or epistemology of ethics. They're the right or wrong. They're not about good or evil or correct or incorrect. They're back based on perfect feedback. God doesn't need to give us a uh, creed of judgment or creed of value. It is expected that we are divine beings and when we see the effects of the clauses that we have put forward, we can see whether they are pro-evolutionary or not, whether they are good or bad. Now, this doesn't mean that we should give up on ideals and idealism, because even if they are slightly skewed, they still heighten our experience. They raise us so that we can experience, so that we, the Spirit, can watch and look at the cosmos and uh, determine for ourselves. And ethical systems provide a means into the unknown. Even the most rigorous uh, material scientists use a tentative hypothesis. So if we consider our value systems as tentative hypotheses, we're much more likely to be successful. All right. Obviously, everything we've been going through for the last quite a few minutes is another one of those long disclaimers. <laughs> it's an introductory disclaimer. In the next few minutes, we're going to sling around quite a few of those labeled words, those potentially and actually judgmental words. It's up to you to ponder them in your heart and to try them in your experience. And if you disagree with me, it's perfectly all right that you disagree. All right, now we're ready to start doing something. The cosmos is astrological. But the astrology of the cosmos is more than planets and stars that we see when we look out on a starry night. The great mysteries writer from the Neoplatonistic school named Porphyry said the zodiac existed before there were stars. The zodiac existed before there were stars. The signs, constellations, and planets are manifestations of creative ideas that have existed ab initio. They've been there from the beginning. We have an example of that very clearly in the Rosicrucian philosophy. We have the Saturn period. And the Saturn period existed way long before there was a Saturn in the, in the solar system. Now, the structure of the worlds is astrologically. Since we're looking at value qualities, the desire world is a good place to begin because we relate to values emotionally. There is a complex in the desire body that we call a pseudo-self or a lower nature or Max Seindel called it an animal soul and uh, that has coalesced together with our concrete mind and it is a product or it was necessitated by our fall because the gods could no longer lead us around because we said we're divine creative beings and we're taking the creative power into our own hands. And they respected that. But without help, we wouldn't get along. 
And so they planted this pseudo-self in the desire nature, which was a reflection of the true self, which is in the region of abstract thought, and there's a resonance between those two realms, and that was to take care of us. However, that pseudo-self got purloined by the same Luciferic spirits that caused the fall in the first place, and so we have this nexus of... Uh, sin within ourselves and we struggle with it and it's not a bad thing we just don't want it to be that way but it gives resistance and that resistance is what awakens and brings the spirit to come into its vehicles more so that it can eventually tame the lower nature so it is in this nexus that we form bad attitudes and our bodies are built, any of our bodies are built on the astrological structure. For example, Jupiter is at the top of the desire world in the desire body. Jupiter is clearly the philanthropic planet. It gives everything it has. Even gifts sometimes what it doesn't have, but that, we won't talk about that very much. Uh, Saturn, in, with its particularity and with its separativeness, is at the bottom of the desire world or the desire body. Both of these planets, in their true nature, have virtues. And... Uh, they have natural values within them. But because we have this deviant nature, this self-centered nature that has removed itself from harmony with the other divine beings and with the cosmic creation itself, those virtues of, of the planets have been distorted. Now, some of the deviations from the divine intention or from the innate character. My goodness, what is... Oh. Some of those deviations are simple yes-no things. Either something is harmonious or something is not harmonious. And with the cosmic creative archetype, uh, we can see that's not the best way to look at them. There are healthier ways. Because if we look at it, the tints and shades of either good or evil are uh, manifold. They're, they're multitudinous. There are many different gradations of good and evil. This is why I used to like to watch television wrestling. Because it was the only place that the good guy was really good and the bad guy was really bad. He was <laughs> because in our, <laughs> in our immaturity, we want to find something like that. Uh, also, since the inner worlds are intensive, the deviations are not only in flavor, they are in degree. So we'll look at a simple, simple example of that. Now, Mars rules pure action, simple, direct action, and we see it as motivational drive. The strength of what comes from Mars is called or referred to as temper. Usually, Mars is at its best when that temper is held together and channeled, which is why Mars has its exaltation in Capricorn, because the Saturnine quality, quality takes that energy and it directs it in a way that it is efficiently used. However, in our fallen egoism, we often tend in our martial nature to resent control and limitation. And in that, we have various Mars behavior. 
Now, if the degree of mismanifestation of Mars is mild, we just see it as somebody who is impatient and restless. But if the degree is stronger, it becomes sort of a balky kind of thing. It is like a like a horse that doesn't want to be ridden. It balks at being directed. And if the degree of deviation is great, it becomes an explosive aggressiveness. So what we're trying to get at is degrees of attitude and or misattitude and how they become manifest. So our time is short. We have already gone through. <laughs> we haven't said anything astrological yet. So we have to get something to something diagnostic because this is supposed to be a talk on diagnosis. All right. This time we are proceeding, obviously, from the nature of this talk, we are proceeding from attitude to illness instead of from illness back in for ad, to attitude. Now, there is a field of study in academe that could be called emotionology. You can even take courses on emotionology in those things that they advertise on the internet called great courses. And there, some of them are quite good. They're also expensive. And most of the people who consider themselves emotionologists are psychologists. Though some of them are anthropologists, and some are historians, and some of them are even uh, literary people. And emotionologists generally agree at what the two most extreme emotions are. The emotions that are the most long-lived and the emotions that uh, are most powerful in their general effect over all of humanity. And they are at opposite ends of the emotional spectrum. And this agrees very much with uh, Rosicrucian philosophy. At one end is love, especially sacrificial love, because it'll endure and it'll overcome anything. And fortunately, the positive pole is stronger than the negative pole. At the negative pole, the uh, emotion that is strongest and longest in duration is hate especially vengeful hate. Vengeful hate will hang on over centuries. Now, obviously, these are very big subjects, and we're going to have to limit ourselves, and so what we're going to do is going to do one real little tiny thing about the diagnostic effects of hate. Speaking very loosely, Hate appears to be a misuse or a deviation in discrimination or protection or in caution or in control. And hate, unlike love, love is general. You can love a whole and you can love an individual. Hate is usually, not always, but is usually very specific. It's personal, especially if it is a severe deviation. Now, in our materialistic blindness to spiritual things, it is possible to eliminate things. I hate that person so I can eliminate them. I won't have to look at them anymore. That's what happens with materialism is if you realize that something's something going to go on and live forever and the only way that you can really have peace or the only way that you can uh, get what you want to get is to harmonize and work together with the other person. But as long as you think that you can uh, you get rid of them, that's, that's the way uh, hate works. You know, this, this is a bad habit we've gotten here in materialism. Now, we don't have time to discuss the origin of evil, even of hate. I have 
given a number of talks on it. In fact, I did a whole series on the mythologies of the origin of good and evil, and it was really a great time. Uh, I can give you recordings if you want them. Um, hate is obviously ruled by Saturn, and Saturn rules ignorance, and the assumption is that hate is a manifestation of ignorance in just the way we described it. Ignorance of the fact that the other person or other people are divine. And hate is without reason. It is without truth. After years and years and years of pondering it, I have come to the conclusion that evil, especially hate, is stupidity. Nothing else but stupidity. You can, if you have somebody who is a hateful being, you can look at the background that they came from, you can look at their past lives, and you can give psychological reasons for why they do this, and why they have this motivation and that motivation. But ultimately, in the end, it's stupid. It has to be stupid if it's going against universal truth. You can't, you can't justify it. And if you look at your own sins, which we are instructed to do and see them clearly for what they are, you realize, wow, that was stupid. Nonetheless, hate exists and it has effects. Now, for the remainder of this talk, we're going to discuss some of the effects of hatred of two kinds. One of the effects of hatred is has to do with a whole family of physical conditions. So this is going to be extremely superficial. Extremely shallow as can be, but it's an introduction. That's all I can do is introduction. I can't do the deep things except with years and years of time. The effects of hatred are Saturnian effects. They are limiting. They are obstructing. They check things. They wither things. And they try to block things or they try to block life and bring it to a stop. Very often, these kinds of malefic effects are the opposite of benefic virtues. And one of the benefic virtues of Saturn and of Capricorn, which is ruled by Saturn, is protection. Bones, especially the flat bones, like in the pelvis and in the skull, are protective bones, and they're ruled by Saturn. But most of the protection in the physical body is, you might say, chemical. Most of the protection in the physical body is in the immune system. And the effect of hatred in astrodiagnosis is to harm the immune system. First, we'll take one very small case of the effect of hatred on the immune system. This is a very brief introduction, and what my hope is when I give these talks is that somebody will take the hints that are in them and carry them out, because there's no way possible that I can carry out all the things that I'd like to carry out, and so we're all in this together, and so we all have to work on it. So this could be a major study. Now, in one way, the immune system is very Neptunian in that the immune system is sensitive. It senses enemies. It senses danger to the physical body. It's very Neptunian. It's sensitive to foreign bodies. In another way, the immune system is Jupiterian in that the main parts of the immune system as seen physically are T-cells, and T-cells produce B-cells, 
And the B cells are big cells that come in and they engulf or they swallow the uh, enemy. If there's a if there's a uh, bacterium or something that is trying to get us, it gets swallowed up. This is opposite the way by uh, uh, what what do you call? <laughs> I'm trying to throw things in and I'm not getting the words. Uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics work very different than the immune system does. Antibiotics come to the uh, suppose there's a bacterial infection. They come to the bacterial infection and they explode it. And then you have to get well, not only from the illness, you have to get well from the poison of the exploded an anti uh, antibiotic on, on the cells. Whereas if the B cells swallow them up, that doesn't happen. You only, you only get well from the illness and not from, from the uh, medicine that's supposed to correct it. And the amount of B cells, uh, T cells and B cells, have a lot to do with positive attitude. Together, Neptune and Jupiter uh, rule, rule Pisces. And you might say, in some ways, an introduction to the immune system is understanding Pisces. It helps you understand why if you, why if you get cold feet, uh, you might get a cold and uh, get ill or something like that from it. Now, sometimes... The immune system goes rogue, and it attacks the body instead of protecting it. Usually, it doesn't attack the body in general. It usually attacks one organ or one system or one area of the body. And these conditions are not like lethal conditions. When there is a minor deviation in the immune system and it attacks the body itself, it's one of, it, they're usually nagging conditions. They don't kill you outright like a poison or something like that, but there's something that hangs on for years. And eventually they wear down our resistance and they make, can make our life pretty, uh, pretty miserable. And when we're worn down, they open the door to more serious conditions. These conditions are called autoimmune diseases. Now, the list of autoimmune diseases is long. If you get on the Internet and go to uh, Wikipedia and type in autoimmune diseases, it will take you to a page and there's a list there at least 80 or 90 different autoimmune conditions. Autoimmune conditions affect almost every part of the body or can affect almost every part of the body. Now, the dense physical body is an expression of the individual, the spirit that built it. Usually it is radiant with life, and that radiance of life is an expression of the will to live by the Creator. So that if we live harmoniously, if we live positively, and we are full life, it's harder for us to be ill. So the question we want to ask ourselves is why would the immune system turn around and attack the system that it was built to protect? And the obvious answer to that, and this is one case where an obvious answer turns out to be right, is that there must be a nagging self-hatred. And immune Autoimmune conditions are usually more manifest later in life when Saturn becomes stronger. And when we look back and we're dissatisfied with, with what we have done with ourselves, we're not happy with ourselves. And sometimes it's easier to complain about it and have negative, nagging negative feelings than it is to change. So autoimmune condition that we're going to look at is uh, arthritis. 
We're going to look at rheumatoid arthritis because that's more martial. And what we have is a horoscope that um, is a real simple. Uh, should more should go this way. It's a real simple horoscope that uh, just to give you the few ideas of what we're looking at. We're only going to look at this one horoscope for this condition and then we're going to move on to some other things. This is the horoscope of James Coburn. And James Coburn was a uh, movie actor. And he was one of those action movie actors. He was the Bruce Willis before Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, you know, he would take on whole armies and things like that. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is a Saturnian condition flavored by Mars. So it has all of the negativity and restriction of Saturn, but it has the nastiness of Mars. And together they represent limiting inflammation, even limiting movement, especially if you get some muscular arthritis in you, you know, like in the shoulders or something like that. In this horoscope, if we look at it, well, I don't have, yeah. In this horoscope, if we look at it, Saturn is opposite to Mars. And it's a pretty strong aspect. It's a little over one degree orb. One degree and 15 minutes or something like that. And the oppositions are between Mars in the second and Saturn in the eighth. So this is one of those cases that goes along with the tightness that comes with the tightness with money. You know, you, when you were young, it was a folk thing. He's got arthritis. He must be tight with his money. That's usually more uh, osteoarthritis, and that uh, applies in this case. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that, that's folklore. Now, the self-hatred is obvious in this horoscope. This is why it shows that it's a really obvious horoscope because, because both Saturn and Mars are square to the sun. And the sun is self. But the squares are mild. And therefore, the self-hatred. It's not something like he's going to commit suicide or something like that. It's going to be something more nagging, like a autoimmune disease. Now, at the same time, Jupiter in the first house is trine to the sun. And that trine is much stronger, which indicates that uh, he had a positive self-esteem, which was stronger than the self-hatred. However, the self-hatred was enough so that he was crippled in his body so much that he could hardly move anymore. But with the positivity of the sun trying Jupiter and being a Virgo in the first place, a little bit diet fatty and things like that, he um, resolved to do something about it. And he studied all kinds of holistic healing approaches and various types of physical therapy. And he did testing. And along the way, he found out that he had 45 food allergies. Food allergies are most common where there's a lot of Virgo. And when he eliminated those food allergies, a lot of the inflammations decreased. And along the way, he discovered spiritual meditation. And he learned that he could control his negative thoughts. And in doing that, he manifests the sun trying Jupiter very well. And the self-esteem is such that he was almost completely healed. He had just a little bit of stiffness in one hand. And this was a man that, you know, couldn't get out of bed almost. It was so bad. So this is, this, this is a very, but he still had the Saturn Mars to work out. 
but the way he worked it out is playing the roles that he played in the movies. And this, this is, this is called, uh, uh, there's, there's a special type of psychology that is called, um, oh, what is it called? Not remembering it right now. But it's a type of psychology where you act things out and in, when acting them out, you see them and once you see, see the negativities in yourself, you can change them. It's, it's a way of, uh, learning but without having to go through the full, painful experience. Yes. So, what? Psychodrama. psychodrama, yes. And psychodrama is when you relive your personal life, and cosmic drama is when you live out a myth. Uh, yeah, I've worked with both types, and they're amazingly good things. In fact, all of the mysteries uh, used to be, when people were initiated in the ancient times, and even all the way down to Freemasonry, they act out uh, myths, and when they act out myths, they see themselves as divine beings, and when they see themselves as divine beings, uh, they become divine beings, they realize reality. All right, we're probably, you, we're, oh, we're not doing so bad, we'll get done by 11.30. Now, self-hatred is not the only debilitating hatred that humans experience. Self-hatred comes from within. But sometimes we have hatred that comes from without. Sometimes from an enemy and sometimes from a group. Unless our enemy is a practiced sorcerer, we can throw off the effects of that hate. But if we... Throw, but trying to throw off the effects of hate from society, that's pretty hard to do, especially if it's intense. And this is because a societal collective feeling or attitude is enormous. Saturn rules hate, and it rules both uh, self-hatred and societal hatred. But Saturn also rules rats. And rats are familial animals. There are packs of rats. And if you take a rat from one pack and take him and put him in another pack of rats, the, other, the new pack of rats will surround them and it will circle around it doing that chirping, growling kind of thing that they do. And the new rat will quiver and fall over dead. So this is a simple um, example of the power of hate when it is collective. Shunning, which is done by some religions, when people start to stray from the religion, they be, get shunned even by their own family, and that's very powerful. Now, I have memories that go way back to the 40s. From my childhood until the present time, there were two groups of people that were pretty much universally hate hated, especially in the 40s and then right after the war. And those two groups of people were considered abominations. And they were considered, um, I don't know, alien. They were indecent. The first group was intravenous drug users. They used to be called drug fiends because they were, nobody liked them. The other group was male homosexuals. They were considered moral abominations, and they were considered against uh, nature. Now, both of these behaviors are not wholesome behaviors, and they're not pro-evolutionary. But hating them is not going to help them. It's not going to make them better. Now, if we... The collective, from the collective influence of generations 
against these two people, eventually, these two kinds of people, eventually had its uh, manifestation. And its manifestation was in acquired immunodeficiency. Meaning to say that the deficiency in your immune system comes from without. We call it AIDS. Now, the societal hatred had its effect. And it built up over the years. And uh, it took out a lot of people. Now, some people actually sneer and they continue in that hatred. And they say, this is what they deserve. You know, humanity is not going to humanity is not going to evolve with those kinds of thoughts going on. So we have two horoscopes that we're going to look at extremely briefly with um, acquired immunodeficiency. The first horoscope is from the from the horoscope of the entertainer. Liberace. Everybody know who Liberace is? You probably even know in England you know who Liberace is. Oh, he was a flamboyant musician. Very flamboyant musician. Jesus, if I knew you were going to be here, I'd have tried to make something more cult- culturally relevant to you. <laughs> All right. In this horoscope, Capricorn is rising. And the ruler... Yes. Yes, West Dallas, right near the State Fair Park. <laughs> yeah. So Capricorn is rising, and Saturn, which is the ruler of Capricorn, is square to Mars and the Sun. See, we see something in here. We have Sun square Mars, Sun Saturn, and Mars again in a um, in a negative combination. But it, it takes intuition to tell what, whether it's going to be autoimmune disease or acquired immune disease or whether it's going to be something else. This is why astrodiagnosis we've been seeing every day is so hard to, to learn. I, the hard parts of it I can't, I can't get at all. But at any rate, the way it worked is the Capricorn on the Ascended, he was easily... He was extremely shy, but he overcame his shyness, and that is shown by Uranus, and Uranus is um, sextile to Mercury, and let's see, where is it? it's trying to Venus and Pluto. And the Iranian part of all of that, he brought out as a great flamboyancy, he made a lot of money as an entertainer. He was a good musician, but he didn't make his money as a musician. He had those teeth that seemed to sparkle and radiate light, light out. And he dressed. He had one costume that he wore that weighed 53 pounds because it was filled with all kinds of frills and sparkly things. And, yeah. and the people loved him. He had a television show that... Uh, yes, I thought he was wonderful. <laughs> 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 yeah, the women especially like him. Yeah, he, yeah. He made a lot of money. He went to Las Vegas and people loved him. He was on television and people loved him. And he made money in another way. He has Jupiter in the seventh house, which is lawsuits. And he had defamation of character lawsuits against people who claimed he was a homosexual. And they could never prove it in court. And he got large amount. Right? Yes. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one way of turning the tables on all that hatred coming from society. Yes, yes. But at any rate, you couldn't prove it in a court of law. But you couldn't, he couldn't lie to reality. No. And he got AIDS. And uh, everything came out then, and he couldn't no longer deny. Now, his secret was probably not his homosexuality, 
but how he felt about it. With that Sun square to uh, Saturn square to Mars and the Sun, he clearly has a lot of personal fear. If society hates homosexuals and you're a homosexual, you're going to have a lot of fear. You, there, you know, in some places they kill people who are homosexuals. In fact, I think it's a law in Uganda. Uh, they're, they're in Uganda right now, if you're a homosexual, they, they kill you. And it's, that's the way they think. Good way to advance evolution, isn't it? To cure somebody by killing them. <laughs> no, no healing in that. But at any rate, he was an extremely nervous and worrisome person. He was a chain smoker. And for all of his flamboyance, for all of his wealth, he was still that frightened little boy. And he never overcame that. He died of the AIDS, but, you know, it was a tough life. The only time he was happy was when he was performing, and he was a stupendous performer. All right. Now we have to... I don't like to close with negative things, but we have to look at probably one of the most negative horoscopes you're ever going to see in your life. Liberace received a lot of love from society, but some people do not receive love from society. And the last horoscope that we're looking at is someone whose life was filled with hatred. Hatred for other individuals from in the other individuals and from society at large. The Senate of the United States openly chastised this man uh, at a hearing and it came down on him really hard. This is Robert, Robert Maplethorpe. And Robert Maplethorpe was in that in crowd in New York City. They used to hang out at Max's Kansas City, you know, like Andy Warhol and all of those people. These this were the in, in very, the sharp, the, the, you know, the clever people hung out. And he tried to be a movie maker and he was successful at it. And he tried other art forms, but he eventually became a photographer. And as a photographer, he was so good, and he could capture a certain uh, uh, a certain expression on someone that was very hard to do. And he charged ten thousand dollars for a photograph. Unbelievable! And there are people who were willing to pay it because it put him in a good light. But that's not where he made most of his money. He uh, made most of his money in. Uh, homosexual pornography and they were, they were photographs in very artistic settings of people doing all kinds of homosexual pornographic uh, acts but at any rate this is a person who by his own admission never had a pleasant day in his life and the only time that he had any pleasant la- pleasantness at all is when he was involved in a fascination. He would become almost like in a hypnotic situation. And so we see the sun conjoined Jupiter in Scorpio. And that's the sign of fascination. It's also the sign of sex. And it's a really tough combination. But if we look, they square... Saturn conjoined Pluto. With Saturn, Jupiter, and Pluto, irrespective of the sun, that's the world's fair for prejudice. And Scorpio on top of it is the sign of prejudice. 
So this is someone who was prejudicial and who was the victim of prejudice. And all of it was worked out sexually. He was a sadist of the worst kind. And he was a prejudicial sadist in that he would find African Americans who were masochists. And he would beat them and he would paint them with his own excrement <laughs> and things like that. It's hard for me to believe things like that. But that's, that, that was his occupation. And obviously, with all that, the tenth house is society. And if you have those two very powerful, very dark planets, it indicates that he was subjected to societal hatred. And he took it in, and he reveled in it. And when the senator, he, he, he was given a grant from uh, what is the National Endowment for the Arts, and he rebelled against the Catholic religion he had, and uh, he did this lovely photograph of uh, an artistic glass filled with urine and a crucifix in it. And the senators, <laughs> they couldn't handle that at all. And they censured him. And he came back with wisecracks. This is, this is somebody that is really deeply into perversion. Not just sexual perversion, any kind of perversion you can think of. So it's not surprising that with all of this hatred coming toward him and him instigating it, it's not surprising that he died of AIDS. Now, we can't remove ourselves from humanity. We're in this. Whether we like it or not, we are in an atmosphere of human emotions. It is our inner work to not deny that, to not remove ourselves from that, but it is our inner work to heal that. The elder brothers of the Rosicrucian order have at midnight every night, they have a... Uh, service in which they open themselves and they're wise enough to know how to do that safely and they take in as much of the hate as they can that is generated by the world and they transform it or they transmute it in a spiritual alchemy into something positive and then they radiate it or give it back out into the world that's what we're supposed to be doing as we said in the early part of this talk, our work is thinking. And it's up to us to be like spiritual radio stations. We're supposed to develop positive thoughts and radiate them out because we're, we're, we can't get away from this. All we can do is help people to transform themselves and to help send society to transform itself. And when we study things like this, we don't try to revel in the negativity. We try to take that pain as a motivation to intensify our prayers. Because our intensified prayers are more likely to be effective. And that's the only reason we ever look at a horoscope that is this negative. All right, it's now time to do a little practice of that. Oh God... Increase our love for Thee, so that we may serve Thee better from day to day. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Yeah. I remember that um, controversy, but I didn't know the name. Yeah. <laughs> At the time that this happened, you couldn't avoid it on the news. Yeah. It was very repulsive. Questions? Okay.